Coming up on American Black Journal, our roundtable is back to tackle the stories that are affecting African-American life. We're going to talk about the presidential campaign. We'll talk about the continued shootings of unarmed Black people and the death of actor Chadwick Boseman. You don't want to miss this conversation, so stay where you are. American Black Journal starts now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation, Ally, and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. 2020 continues to be a year that really is just for the history books. We witnessed the first black woman nominated for vice president by a major party. And for the first time ever, professional athletes refused to play in protest of the shooting of yet another unarmed black man by police. And then sadly, we lost an actor whose portrayal of the Black Panther change the way black kids perceive themselves. I talked about these stories with my roundtable guests, Karen Dumas, Brandon Bryce, Greg Bowens, and Carrie Leon Jackson. Okay, I wanna welcome our outstanding and distinguished roundtable to American Black Journal, uh, a group of experts on everything politics and culture here in the city of Detroit. Karen Dumas, Greg Bowens, Brandon Bryce, and the urban conservative, Carrie Leon Jackson. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks, Steve. Good to be here. So, Greg, I'm going to start with you so you can explain where you are and what you're doing. This is a really important event here in the city of Detroit. Yeah, right now I am at uh, Belisle at the memorial for the people who have fallen victim to COVID-19. I'm right at uh, Vista Avenue at Riverside Drive on the Detroit side. Detroit is to my left. Canada's to my right. And I came out here earlier. This is the last day, I believe, of the memorial so that I could you know, pay my respects to uh, some of my friends, uh, people that I knew that had fallen victim, and, and surprisingly, some people that I had known who had also fallen victim to it. And it's just an amazing kind of time. Uh, growing up in Detroit, I've been to Belle Isle and been on this very street for lots of things but none of them included a memorial. I never thought that we'd have to do this and it seems like such a fitting tribute. And, and trying to find the, the blackest place, <laughs> sadly is, you know, for American Black Journal, sadly today is right here where this memorial is, seeing all the people coming by and seeing all the victims who were mostly black. So it's a, it's a very moving tribute and, you know, I'm very, I, I don't know, I just feel humbled to be here. And I'm very happy that we have the opportunity to at least chronicle this, this little bit uh, on American Black Journal. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're out there. And I'm glad you're out there while we're, while we're having this conversation and allows us to include it uh, in the show. Um, all right, I wanna start with the politics and uh, the political conventions that we saw over the last couple of weeks and the kickoff to the fall political season. This is gonna be a wild one. I don't think anybody has a, a doubt about that. Karen, what do you make of this race as we get into the, into the thick of it, into the fall campaign? 
Well, uh, I watched and reported for uh, the free press for both uh, the Democratic National Convention and the Republican National Convention. Um, and, you know, I hate to say it, but on both sides, it just feels like politics as usual. Um, I know people were excited about the nomination for Kamala Harris, um, but, you know, the, the campaign just kind of lacks the sincerity and the energy that I think is needed to really pull off a win. Uh, of what course, do you, Donald what do you Trump. Want them doing? What do you want them to do? You know, I don't, and I don't think it's anything that they can do because right now you're not able to resonate with people because of COVID. You know, you got social distancing. So I think that you know that costs a little bit on the energy side. On the other hand, you got the Republicans that say we don't care about that. You know, we're going to all sit here and, and and touch each other and do whatever. Um, we need to do. But, you know, unfortunately, it all feels like politics as usual. Uh, and if, in fact, you know, I do think it's going to be a close race. Uh, and I, I think that the Democrats have a lot to do uh, to really uh, win this and, and, and beat Trump's base. I mean, he's energizing his base. He's fueling them with fear. Uh, and, and it seems to be working, unfortunately. Uh, uh, Carrie Leon Jackson, this president has a pretty profound problem with black people uh, to start with. Uh, he, he seems to be making that worse uh, with the positions he's taking now and the sort of reactions that he has to the, the issues that are, that are coming up. I have said a couple times that, uh, that he is taking a page from George Wallace in the way that he's running this campaign. I mean, really running uh, open-faced uh, into, into the sort of bias and racism uh, that, that exists in that place. Is that something that can work in 2020? Obviously. And I would not be surprised if he said segregation now, segregation forever. He, he, he is speaking to a segment of society that has, they've embraced it. And the truth is, Stephen, remember, and Karen has said, you know, I don't know what more she, that segment, Barack Obama only won by six points. We've always had a, a very close race when it comes to the presidency. It, it, there is no reason for us to believe that America has swung that much in the last few years. It always comes down to that small segment of society. The question is, has Trump, with his open, overt racism, has he pissed off enough of those people who swung to the the in order to support Barack Obama, has he pissed him off enough for them to say, oh my God, I could never support him. The, the, the thing is, four years ago, a few of those people, they hid their support for him. Right. They, they, they were, it was surprising. You, you, you thought, you know what? Maybe they, they weren't going to do it. Maybe they weren't going to fall for it. And they walked into that booth and they supported him. This time, I don't know. I think that he's, he has done enough to support his base, he might just have pissed off enough of those other folks, the the people that are out there in the suburbs, yeah. uh, to and and we might have at least um, inspired enough people, uh, enough of our folks, enough of um, uh, uh, those of us that are in the middle of the road, to say, you know what, we can't sit this out. That guy's crazy. We actually need to get up off our butts and we need to vote against him this time. Yeah. I'm hoping we can do that. Uh, Brandon Bryce, uh, black turnout is everything in this election. It is everything right here in the state of Michigan. If you, if you talk about the difference in turnout between 2012 and 2016, 20,000 Detroiters who did not cast ballots in 16, they'd voted presumably for Hillary Clinton. Uh, she probably be the president right now. Uh, is that going to look different this fall for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris? Uh, and is the president going to get the kind of support that he did from places like Macomb County uh, in, in 2016? So, you know, this is an interesting question when we talk about uh, the black vote, because I think oftentimes we think that the black vote votes one way. It's one and, that, and that is not the case. Uh, I think the challenge, I actually watched both conventions. Uh, I think Joe Biden, you know, the, the Democrats painted this doom and gloom picture. But I think on the other side, the Republicans didn't acknowledge what's right in front of most Americans face. And that's the crisis of COVID. And so I think you've got a big challenge here uh, where the question is, and I actually have independents uh, that have come on my show. Uh, and many of them have said, 
It's going to come down to the economy, which if you really looked at the convention, neither convention really talked about getting people back to work. Uh, it was it was politicized as most. But I'll tell you one thing that I, that I did see uh, that should be very concerning to a Joe Biden. Uh, you know, one of the things is if you've ever worked in government, uh, politicians, you never walk into an empty room. And one of the challenges is that one thing that Donald Trump did uh, massively, keep in mind, this guy understands the media. He understands how the press works. Uh, one of the things that I think was a, was a faux pas on the DNC is it showed an empty room uh, with both uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Now, keep in mind, uh, we're dealing with a COVID crisis. But at the end of the day, people look at that. And I think that when you talk about the press moving in now into the debates, uh, people are going to really, I mean, I mean, Joe Biden really needs to bring it because you're talking about a guy who literally made his, made his career off of one thing, understanding how the press and how media work. Mm. Uh, Greg, I want to get you to talk about the conventions, but, but also about the moment uh, that we're experiencing and what role it will play in, in the elections. I mean, uh, I saw an article a few weeks ago that said, there are more people who have participated in these demonstrations against systemic racism and police brutality than in any social movement in American history. So if you think about that, that means suffrage, that means civil rights, uh, that means the anti-war movements, all were smaller than what we have seen just in the last few months uh, because of uh, the killing of George Floyd and, and now uh, other incidents uh, like uh, the shooting of, of Jacob Blake. Uh, is that going to tip the election against a president who is staring that in the face uh, and saying pretty much he doesn't really care about it? Well, uh, I, I do. I think that what you're pointing out right there in relationship to the number of people that have joined up in these marches is pretty important, particularly when we find that what is what is happening now is that people are more tuned in on things like the device I'm using right now to be here on American Black Journal. And so their ability to be able to organize through social media, through the internet, and other ways has never been done before. That technology didn't exist. But it does exist now. And I think the numbers of people that we've seen in the streets is a direct result of them being able to leverage, or people just being able to leverage the technology that we have. And so uh, that kind of thing, I believe, will continue on. Here in Michigan, where there's just a couple of points that continues to separate uh, the president from uh, Joe Biden, I think it becomes really important to leverage that technology even more. Yeah, you didn't have a bunch of people screaming without mask on at some, some event where Joe Biden attended. But at the same time, what the Republicans didn't give you during their convention was an overview of America when everybody checked in to nominate Joe Biden for the, uh, the Democratic nomination. That was awesome to see so many people from around the country and the different territories. And one of the things that I think we haven't talked about here, but I think we need to keep in mind is that the Democrats in this state and the performance of the governor is also going to have an impact on the presidential race. Uh, people that are really ticked off at the governor about, you know, the stay at home orders and that kind of thing. This will be their first time to sort of demonstrate their anger through the ballot bots at that. Uh, her numbers are really good though, in terms of people thinking that she did a great <laughs> job in, yeah. Yeah, in, in helping manage it. So maybe that will be the boost that we need. Certainly, I think that in order to take advantage of that, we've got to pivot on this COVID thing harder than what we've been doing. I know the governor came out here for the memorial service you know, that was nice. I, I, I can't see how this would not, on a local level, solidify even more support for Mayor Duggan mm -hmm. in being able to, you know, pull this together and get it on. I, I, I know that uh, the arts director is the one that is getting a lot of credit for it, but it happened under his watch, and we've never seen it happen before. And who would have thought that, in fact, you could have had a memorial of, for 1,500 people the majority of them black on state owned property, you know, in the middle of the city. So uh, it's, it's, these are really interesting times, but I, you know, we can't discount the technology that's being used here. Yeah. That's brought people out Karen, to the streets. Karen, you're shaking your head. 
Because that's all performative stuff. And that's the things that people do in hopes that they're going to tap into feel good. At the end of the day, that does nothing. I mean, people want to, you know, politicians do that all the time. The whole empathy thing was, you know, Joe Biden's asset in his presentation and the lack thereof in uh, Trump's. But politicians exploit people all the time. Black people and kids are the most exploited groups ever. And that's what's happening. That's great. That's fine. It's never been done before because we've never been in the middle of a pandemic before. Bill Isle used yeah, to yeah. be a place where black people could congregate when the state took over. No, that's not the, that's not the case anymore. So, I mean, that, that looks good and it reads well, but it does very little to change the quality of life of a predominantly African-American city where people are still trying to figure out what to do next. So, yeah. I think, I think, you know, Karen, I think you're, I think you're missing my point. I understand what you're saying. Maybe so. My point is, yeah, let me, let me try and explain to you this way. Can you do uh, it quickly? The, you know, I'm yeah, I can see. do it really quickly. No, quickly. <laughs> the, the point is, is that technology is only good if it can bring people together. And those people getting in the street for Black Lives Matter and the protests around the country are strong evidence of the ability for technology to bring people out. To make so a difference. What? I got that. It's not okay. a so what? I, no. No, I got that, though. But the thing about it is, is that you got people that are in these protests that don't know why they're out here marching. You had the guy that was on McNichols asking where it was Six Mile because he didn't even know why he was here. So people wanting to be a part of something is one thing. People actually engaging is another. And they, that, that, that is a bad example. Steven, people know Steven. why they're coming out. They might not know the direction. They might not know, they know why they're coming out. No, they don't. Brandon, of course they do. Steven, Brandon, Steven. go ahead and, and talk about talk about this this movement that we're seeing last week we I'm going to tell you I'm going to tell you the, the movement take take to the stage in a way that they hadn't before so many of these things are unprecedented uh, in in terms of what we've seen before it's it's hard to imagine that they won't matter at all what do you think you, you know this it, it all matters Stephen but let me say this i found it very interesting when michael moore uh, and don lemon and out of all people bill mauer actually said hey, we're nervous because there's an uptick of a movement that the Trump folks, they're energized. Whether you like the guy or not, they're ready to vote for their guy. The question is, can the Democrats, unfortunately, say the same thing about their candidate? Here's what's interesting. You know, I, literally, and I travel all throughout the state, everywhere I go, I see a Trump, uh, a Make America Great sign all over the place. And the challenge with that is you got to sit here and say, well, why are white voters or uh, why are even some American voters still voting for this particular president? And I'll tell you why. The reason is, is because every time, and even Don Lemon said this, when you see the riots, and let, let's not think of folks from the city, let's think of folks coming from the suburbs, those voters. When you see riots, there's a fear inside it. These people are saying, you know what? I trust this law and order that that will actually, uh, be, that this president will keep me safe. Now, will he, that, that's a whole other topic, but the narrative that the GOP is, is, is crafting is that, Law and order, this president will keep you safe, vote this president in. And I can tell you something. The fact that you got three people who are vehemently against this president who have come out and said, hey, we're nervous. I mean, even Bill Maurer said this is reminding him slowly of 2016 with Hillary. It yeah. tells you that if it just tells you the debates, if, if Joe Biden does not bring it on these debates, Trump could could be reelected in November. Uh, Carrie, go ahead. No, I, I, oh, you said Carrie. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, no. I, I, the, as far as it being performative is one thing. The thing is, I remember a movement in 1992, mm -hmm. and as much as I supported George Bush, the, the first one, there was a movement of people that stood in line 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night to kick him out of office. As long as there's a movement of people that hate you enough and that they're that angry against you, they will do whatever they've got to do, including, as, as everybody has said, stand in line, show up wearing a mask, do whatever they've got to do to throw you to the curb, to kick you to the curb. There are enough, There is a movement of enough people that are that angry at Donald Trump to kick him to the curb. Yeah. What I'm worried more about is that, that, that sliver of folks that are that they're white Americans who are lying to your face, who are going to stand there and say, I would never vote for him. And yep. you don't know what they're going to do. Yep. Those are the people. This has I, happened before, Steve. It, it this has happened, happened before. before. Here's something that I have been saying for a while as well. Donald Trump lost the election in 2016 by more than 3 million votes. In the four years since then, he has done nothing to try to attract 
more voters than he got then. All he's done is make people angry and, and, and alienate folks. So it, it seems almost certain that he will lose the popular vote by more than he did in 2016, which makes it even harder to win in the electoral college. Because if you, you know, these three states where he won very narrowly, if you, those margins are eliminated very, very quickly. So the worry that people have, I think, is real, but I don't know how real the numbers are for this president to recover at this point and what the opportunity is to recover. We've got nine weeks. Steve, 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 real, real quick, I think it's going to come down to. Uh, God forbid we have another COVID wave. That's going to play a factor. Uh, but also, I think it's going to come down to the debates. And, and quite frankly, you know, I mean, I, I think if, if COVID no, continues, then, then, then he'll struggle. Uh, I think if we don't hear from him, if, if, if luckily, thank God, if we don't have another COVID issue, another wave, month, I think he wins. We've got 183,000 dead Americans and every one of them had a family. We'll be at 200,000 dead Americans by the end of the month. We don't need another wave. We cannot stop the folks who are dying now. So he he could have stopped it. He could have cared. He didn't care. So we don't need another wave. We just need to. I want to make sure we get to, to, to Chad okay. Bozeman before we run out of time. Uh, this has just been a crushing year in terms of, of loss. Uh, of course, this didn't have anything to do with COVID, but on top of COVID, it just, uh, it just is one of those things that just yanks your heart out of your, out of your chest. Greg, you're at the memorial for Detroiters who died during COVID. I wonder what you make of uh, Chad Bozeman's passing. Yeah, Chad Bozeman's passing was, I, it was a wake up call for us in a way that we haven't been used to. You know, he suffered in silence for a long time with the type of colon cancer that he had. And uh, when he died, the, I know the first thing that I thought about was, oh man, you know, another victim of, of COVID-19. But no, this is a victim of an illness that has been striking down black men in particular for many, many years. And uh, this, his, his, his ability to be a superhero one more time for us, <laughs> to be a hero one more time for us uh, by letting his, the way that he died be known. And it served as a vehicle and continues to serve as a vehicle for the brothers to get checked out yeah. much earlier than, uh, than has been suggested. I've been checked out. I don't know if y'all have, but- uh, yeah, It was you know, my first year. <laughs> yeah, you gotta do it, man. And so, the uh, how, how the superhero Black Panther is handled in the future will be an interesting thing to see, yeah. you know, not yeah, recasting who, who, or whatever. Right. Please don't kill him off. No, but at no, the no. same time, yeah, but at the same time, you know, we go Wakanda forever in Detroit. And it's because Detroit is the closest thing that we have to the fictional Wakanda. I don't know about, you know I don't know about that, buddy. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. You know, majority black place. <laughs> You know, lots oh, of leadership, innovation. Stop what are you it. talking about? Stop it's all it. about the culture, no, baby. You know, we could probably fight about that for a couple of hours. Let, <laughs> let's do that. But yeah, let's we're, get to we're it. We've run out of time, and we always do with this group, but I love that uh, that we have uh, you guys here to, to do this and, and to have these discussions. Uh, we're going to do it again. We for sure are going to do it again before the election. Let's wait till there's a, a debate or two and then uh, we'll come back together and see what we think. Uh, Karen Dumas, Greg Bowens, Brandon Bryce, Carrie Leon Jackson, as always. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you so Thank much. You. God bless you. Have a great day. That's going to do it for us today. If you want to check out other episodes of American Black Journal, just go to AmericanBlackJournal.org. And you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time.